What's going on? What up? What up? What up? It's your man, Raphael Haynes, a.k.a. Mr. Controversy. Did you miss me? And of course, you know, if I'm here, I got a special guest and I have a special guest. The one they call the, um, what do they call it? The, is it the athletic activist mm-hmm. or the activist athlete? I, how does it go again? Activist athlete, uh, you know. Activist athlete, my, my yeah. guy. <laughs> Ethan Thomas, how's it going today, man? Oh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. How you doing? I'm great. Um, still yearning for some sports. Of but, course, um, as we all are. Hey, I, right, <laughs> but like you know, we'd rather be healthy. No than... question. <laughs> no question. <laughs> and speaking of that, what 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 have you been doing to keep yourself busy or watching any binging any shows, anything like that? Well, I mean, I got, you know, me and my wife, I always say I got. And my wife would be like, all right, don't say, like, you have kids. I, we have kids. I'm like, all right, babe, you go, my bad. <laughs> but we have, we have three kids. So we, you know, doing the homeschooling and, you know, uh, working out with them. My daughters play volleyball. My son plays basketball and soccer. So we're working out with them and, you know, we're chilling. The days kind of move kind of quick. And then plus I have my, my, my show that I do for ESPN Syracuse and, mm-hmm. you know, days kind of go so we're we're quarantined though we're not one of the people that's going out trying to kick it because you know some stuff is opening up we're we're in so <laughs> yeah, we're in, i'm in uh, atlanta i'm in atlanta and you know they open up everything and yeah, whatever they trip i'm not going out there they trip <laughs> they, they like, trip even you know i know people say okay you going to barbershop no so my man. barber he, he created a shed and it's a bar he has his barbershop in the shed just one person at a time he uh-huh. has the face mask plus the, the uh, right. shield okay. and gloves. Put your gloves every every um person he cut. So all right, that ain't bad. Safe. Yeah, yeah. Bad. But other than that, I'm 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 at the house, man. So I'm I'm definitely with you. I mean, it's but, crazy because they open it up everywhere, and they you know they bring yeah. they bring the NBA back. They got the plans for the NBA. They got the plans for the MLB. You know, they have plans for hockey. They trying to push you sports back. I'm like, and I I coach AAU. I coach my son's AAU team. And I told all my parents, I was like, look, I don't care what they say. We're not going to be coming back immediately. We go, if they come back, we're going to wait a full month and see what happens when they come back. And everybody, they was all on board with me. I was like, all right, cool. Y'all all on board. But we ain't just going to jump out there just because they open stuff up. <laughs> right. And speaking of NBA, you know, like you stated, they've been talking about it, opening up. Um, it's funny because I don't think Adam Silver wants to do it. I, just, I know. It. I, I, I yeah, I don't think he wants to do it at all. But 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 he but, but the thing about Adam Silver, and I, I had the chance to interview Adam Silver, and the thing that sets him apart from David Stern, and you don't want to talk, you know, ill about somebody that's passed, but Adam Silver listens to people and he right. and he tries to do things, you know, where if the people all say that they want to do something. So, you know, he listens to the players. Um, you know, he he's he's a person who really wants to be the the uh, a player's commissioner. You know, like a player's coach, like a player's commissioner. Right. Um, Roger Goodell's not the same. You know what I mean? Other no. other commissioners not the same, but he, he's somebody who's different. So he's going to try to figure out every way that he can possibly do it. And if it doesn't work, he tried. Yeah, and we right. were just talking about that on the show. Um, and I said the same thing. It, he's that, I just like the fact that he's, all right, let me try. Right. But I just felt like some inside, he's like, yeah. I really don't want to do this. I right. want to be safe, which is cool. Right. Could you imagine playing in an empty stadium? I don't think that part would be so much the issue because guys, you know, we scrimmage, you know, each other. We, we know, you know, and the scrimmages be just like, you know, you're in a game situation. They'd be competitive, everything right. like that. I don't think that part will be as, you know, as traumatic i think it's just more i'm interested in seeing how many guys elect not to play that's what i'm interested in seeing Mm. because there's going to be guys that don't feel safe playing they don't want to play they don't want you know because there's a lot of question marks everything is opening up and you know we have trump telling us that everything is fine but don't nobody believe trump except for them people you know what i mean his his support is the only one that's believing that exactly (laughs) so so um, you have all these question marks so a lot of guys don't I, – I would imagine they wouldn't feel comfortable or safe, you know, just going back and playing like nothing is happening. Because Damian Lillard came out and said – I mean, mm-hmm. they're, they're three and a half games back, but he was like, look, depending on what they do as far as the league, as far as how many games, we don't have a real chance of getting to the playoffs, I'm not playing. 
Right. Which I, I agree. I understand. I but agree. I think you're, you're going to see more people elect not to play and not just for playoff reasons, but just for safety reasons. They don't feel. Right. And, and I think the NBA's plan is probably the one of the better plans that I've heard. You know, I mean, the I didn't MLB's plan. I heard theirs. I heard hockey's. Um, UFC's was was ridiculous, but they didn't go ahead and go and do that. But um, yeah, their their plan of what they're trying to do down at Disney World and how they're trying to construct it is probably one of the better plans. But I still don't know if I would feel all that comfortable, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I definitely miss it um, being in the media. But I'm like, man, safety first. So of course. I'd- hope they go safety first of course. now with you how were you introduced to basketball because former nba player we know uh-huh. how were you introduced to the sport oh from a young age you know watching watching ball with my grandfather and you know my grandfather was a diehard knicks fan diehard mm-hmm. knicks fan everything new york yankees you know hey, he didn't like the mets that much but everything new york you know so mm-hmm. we was watching the the you know, the, the Knicks, like, from early, early days. My dad wasn't as big of a basketball fan. You know, he wasn't – but my grandfather, he was – oh, we was we watching the, the Yankees. And, you know, baseball, it's cool. You know what I mean? Like, I watch it because I'm chilling with my grandfather, but it wasn't the most exciting sport, to be honest with you. You know, but, yeah, but going to the park, um, you know, going in, going into watching, you know, Rucker Park and going through the parks in, in New York and everything like that and – you know, with my grandfather, and then I just started wanting to do what I see the older guys do. Cool. And you went to Syracuse, mm-hmm. played for the le- legendary Jim Bohan, Bayham, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. And yeah. Playing for him, man, knowing that's a legend, what what was that like? What was that experience like? It was cool. I mean, like, so so my freshman year, I didn't really play a lot. You know, I was behind mm-hmm. a, a, you know, a, a great center, Otis Hill, and I learned a whole lot from him. Um, but I wouldn't. I didn't play a lot, so I was the bottom man of the, on the totem pole. I was all the way at the bottom. You know what I mean? <laughs> like gum on the bottom of the shoes totem pole. And right. and and so my first year, I didn't like Syracuse at all. I wanted to transfer. I was like this close to transferring. Yeah, I was about to be wow. out. I was about to be wow. gone. I, I hated it. I didn't like it. I didn't like Bayheim. It was cold. Oh, uh, you know, half of my. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So half of my. My you know, all my boys is at OU, Oklahoma University, mm-hmm. and they all together. I see them all in pictures, like we all kicking it. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm up here in the cold, not playing. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's snowing. Right, right. You know, just having the blues. So I was about to be out, but you know, uh, I'm glad I did stay. And everything changed my sophomore year, and um, you know, it was just kind of rolling from there. Do you have any uh, misconceptions about, or are there any misconceptions about Bayham? You know, we see him, the fiery coach. We know how he is. But, like, as for instance, I can tell you a story. My first, my second college game I ever covered mm-hmm. was Syracuse versus George, Georgia Tech here. And so I'm nervous already because this is behind. We get into the, we get into a um, press conference. So I'm like, I think I'm asked a question. I'm nervous. <laughs> and some reporter asked him, well, it seemed like during the game you wanted to do this, but it didn't happen. What was your thought process? And Bayham said, "That's what you evaluated. <laughs> so you evaluated that. That's what you thought." <laughs> um, he said, "Are you the coach?" And, yeah. and he went in, yeah. and I'm looking like, "Man, yeah. I'm not asking no questions." No, no. Bay- Bayham has an interesting relationship with the media, <laughs> and so he, he he messes with the media, and he like has the, you know, he he gets a little irritated by some of the questions sometimes. But then he like he get, he he does things like that. So that's he's always been doing that. Like that's that's just just you know like when people criticize the zone and he like you know I've been playing this for how long? You've watched me play this for how long? You think I'm gonna come out of it now because you think that I should? You know. So that's that's just Coach Bay. <laughs> yeah, that that's him. So you you win Big East Defensive Player of the Year your senior year. Yeah. Was that when you realized okay? I'm about to be playing in the NBA, or did you have that feeling before then? Well, I wanted my junior and senior year, um, you know, okay, back to back. Okay. Yeah, so I was just kind of like, you know, I was just enjoying playing ball, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, my sophomore year was like my breakout year, so I, 
I love playing. There was no, you know, no pressure or anything like that. Just, 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 you know, you have the opportunity to play where you didn't get the opportunity the year before. You're just having a blast. And so, you know, after my junior year was really kind of when I started, you know, thinking about the NBA because other people were telling me. I remember we lost to Oklahoma State um, in the tournament my junior year, and I was pissed because I had played AAU against all of these guys. Like all of them, Desmond Mason, Joe Atkins, the, the whole the whole half of the team, I'd have grown up playing AAU against them, you know, because I played in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So we lost that game. I had a real good game, but we lost. I was upset. You know, then you had the, the agents telling you, hey, you should come out. If you come out, you'll be, you know, in the first round. Or you have, you know, different people saying this and that. And I had a good conversation with, um, you know, my grandfather. I had a good conversation with my assistant coach, Louis Orr. Like that was my guy. And, you know, he said, yeah, if you come out now, you'll probably go to the end of the first round. He was like, but, you know, how the NBA is set up, the, the, the players that go in the end of the first round, they're most likely going to be drafted to a real good team. You know, because the lottery, pick, the higher you go, usually the worse the team. And he's like, mm-hmm. so if you come back next year, you can go to a lot to a lottery pick. The money is better. The security is better. And you have more chance of an opportunity to play in the beginning part of your years where if Mm. you get if you get picked in the bottom of the first round most likely you're gonna have to sit and watch but then the clock's ticking so if you don't play that year you don't play the next year then if they don't pick up your option you could be out the league and i was like well that makes sense (laughs) you know what i mean so i came back my senior year and i ended up the 12th pick you know and it was it was was a great decision to come back first season you played you played 2001 to 2002 season Mike decides to come back, right for the Wizards. You were the Wizards, yeah, man. What was your thoughts? Was it was that nerve wracking? Were you excited? It was like okay, crazy. I'm playing now, Jordan here. It was crazy. So, so I, I first got drafted to the Dallas Mavericks. I was the first player right. that Mark Cuban ever drafted. I was the number twelve mm-hmm. pick, the first player. So it was great. But I, I got I got hurt in training camp, so I had to have um, surgery on my foot. So I didn't play that first year with Dallas. And in the middle of the year, we, you know, half the team got traded to Washington with um, for when Juwan Howard came down from Washington to Dallas. Right. It was that year. Yeah. So, you know, MJ came out, came out of retirement and, you know, Washington was really like 18 games winning. You know what I mean? That it wasn't a very so everybody was going to be able to play. All the young players were going to be able to play. Nobody cared. We didn't have no TV games. Wasn't nothing like that going on. Didn't nobody care about no watching the Wizards, right? MJ comes back, and every game is sold out. We have literally like 50 <laughs> TV games. <laughs> 50. I remember I was watching. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and everything is completely different. But the, you know, the so I had to just kind of, you know, wait my turn. He had a lot of veterans around. But the person that I felt, bad for was Kwame Brown. That's who I felt bad for. And Kwame, now listen, there's a lot of misconception about Kwame. Kwame was the best player in that draft. I saw with my own eyes that the Wizards brought him in and they brought in Tyson Chandler and then they brought in Eddie Curry and they brought in two other top big men. And Kwame destroyed all of them. Like it wasn't even Mm. close. Like, not just, you know, not like they, they played and, you know, they got the best of him. He got the best of it. He was, like, here and they were there. Like, he destroyed right. them. And what happened was with the Wizards, Doug Collins was in a protective mode of Michael Jordan. And it's understandable. You know what I mean? This was Michael Jordan's, like, lad. He come back and everything like that. And everything that went well was – all pushed towards MJ. MJ got all the praise, all the glory, all everything like that, right? If anything ever went wrong, it was Kwame's fault. Anything. Like stuff that even one didn't have nothing to do with Kwame. It was Kwame's fault. And to to put that on a 17-year-old kid, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it was just too much. And I think yeah. that really, it, it was, a, and so that's how me and Kwame got close. Because I was like, man, this is messed up how they doing you, man. You Are you, are you good? Let's go, let's go kick it. Let's go out to eat or something like that. You know what I mean? And chop it up. Cause I was like, man, I wouldn't, I don't know how I would be able to even, you know, function in that kind of a situation. Cause it was right. literally like everything was his fault. 
I was like, wow, that's 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 tough. And see, I remember that. It's funny. My um, shout out to Alex Babs, one of the writers for the Three Point Conversion. He wrote an article. We have these articles called Unpopular Opinions, and it's a group of articles we write our opinions real short. Mm -hmm. It's a big article, but all of us have like a short little article within the article. And he talked about Kwame, how he said Mm -hmm. Kwame wasn't that bad. He he got the raw end of the stick, like you said, because of Michael. And then, of course, he went to L.A. Then. Who's that? Kobe. Kobe. Yeah. You know, right. you know, <laughs> I was like, so, oh, uh, dang. Of all the places to get taken, you know, go with Kobe. <laughs> but it's the same situation. <laughs> so we during the last dance, you hear all, all of those stories about Mike being demanding and Mike being just Mike. You know, he wants to win, mm-hmm. which I understand. You know, like I said, mm-hmm. I'm from Chicago. I'm from the crib. Oh, I got you. But you plan with him. Did you see that? Was he that way? Because it seemed like he was more of the teacher just from watching on the screen. He was more of a teacher in Washington than he was playing with the Bulls. Oh, yeah. No, no, definitely. He definitely was Um, because he had to. He knew that he had to assume a different role, but he still wanted to win. And the pressure was still on. And it was almost like, you know, y'all don't make me look bad. You know what I mean? Type of a type right, of a thing. Right. Because and it was it was if we lost, it wasn't nobody care about none of us. Nobody even know none of our names. It was all MJ. So I get it. Right. But it was just a tough situation, to be honest with you. And it's, you know, it was interesting because it, it was like, I asked him one time, I asked MJ, I was like, why are you even doing this? Like real, like real mm-hmm. talk. Like it was one time we was on the, we was on the training table and, um, you know, he was getting his knee drained for like the 10th time. This was like in the second season. And he was hurt. His back was hurting. And, you know, when the knee drained, it was disgusting. Like they it, like his knee would swell up after every game, look like the elephant mm-hmm. man. Right. And they would have to drain it. And this black goo tar looking stuff would come out. And I'm sitting there, you know what I mean? With my, with my little ice and stem. And I'm like, oh, what is going on over there? So they doing all this and he's in pain and riding and stuff. And I sat and I asked him, I was like, why are you even doing this, man? Like you. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Who cares if we make the playoffs or not? Like you, you're MJ. You know what I mean? Uh, and he looked at me, and it's interesting when he when I said it to him, he looked at me and he was just kind of like, ah, you know what I mean? But he had that competitive drive. Like he wanted to win. I think if he could come out at retirement right now as a new challenge, he would do it because he just has that drive. But I was just like, yeah, bro, you don't really. You ain't got nothing to prove. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's, that's crazy. That's that's a great story. Yeah, I wondered too. I I kind of hated it because he. I felt like he was going to hurt his stats, but still, just to watch him do it for you all mm. and then the effort that he was given. I oh, remember yeah. him diving I think it was last season, diving on the floor, and he mm-hmm. busted Hit his chin. chin. It was yep. like, yeah, it was like yeah. Man. man. So, do you remember your welcome to the NBA moment? Welcome to the NBA. I mean, we're playing with MJ. That was kind of like my. <laughs> I mean, for real. I'm, so, like, we sitting there, and it's crazy because we're around him, right? And mm-hmm. after a while, he becomes like one of the guys. He loved hanging. He loved clowning on the bus. He loved, you know, kicking it on the plane. Like, he liked being around the team, right? So, after mm-hmm. a while, we got used to him. Um, and we would go away for training camp, and we're all together the whole time. So, you know, we're just kind of together. So we're, we're used to everybody. But then we went out and it was like, oh, wow. Yeah, no, no, this is MJ. You know what I'm saying? It was like, you know, those images of Michael Jackson when he was like, you would see the crowd and people would like go crazy when they see him. And it'd be like thousands of people. And like you would see people look at him and just start crying. You know what I mean? Or, right. so, or, or somebody touches, touches arm and it pass out, you know, and stuff like that. That's what we saw with MJ. We were like, dang, this is crazy. You know, because it was like yeah. literally people, you know, like worshiping him. Like it was, it, it, you can't really explain it unless you just see it. And that part, that was the welcome to the NBA moment. You know, you know I was like, wow, this is a whole different other level. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't, I haven't been out with none of the stars like that, but mm. I saw it with, with LeBron. Uh, yeah. Watching him, I covered a game last year. This oh. past year, Lakers came in town, and he couldn't even get out because right. everybody. And, and it's funny; it's not just fans. You had other stars, yeah, the stars, other 
that played in the NBA. They waiting to yeah. see him. Yeah. He's like, is there a back way I can go out? And right. It was so I, I saw that. And yeah, that's that's gotta be interesting. It's crazy. So in 2007, because mm-hmm. the year before you, you starting you starting games now, mm-hmm. you know, you were starting, mm-hmm. then you go have a routine uh mm-hmm. physical, mm-hmm. and then you find out that your it was an aortic. Yeah, aortic, ascending, um, ascending, ascending aorta. So what I had yeah, was aorta, okay. um so I had a leaky valve. Uh, right. and so aorta I had valve. I had that when I was younger. So I had that when I was like in middle school and I just had to get it checked every year. You know, I had to do things a little different, you know, like like say if I had to go to the dentist, I had to get antibiotics. You know, I could mm-hmm. never I can never drink like coffee or anything with caffeine all growing up my whole life, you know, just so the little things I had to do different. But I always knew about it. And I knew at some point I would have to have surgery, right? But I always thought it was going to be when I was old. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when I was an older cat and something like that. But I'm sitting here. I was like 28, like 20, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm starting. I'm, I'm playing well. I'm doing everything like that. Right before training camp, the doctor, and I remember, uh, you know, he, 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 he did my routine. He was like, uh. I was like, well, what's up? What's wrong? Why don't we look making that face? What's wrong? He was like. Uh, let me send you to two other places to get second opinions. And I was like, second opinions of what? You ain't even gave me the first opinion. So he didn't want to say that he thinks that I needed open heart surgery. So he wanted to get two different opinions before he even says anything. So I went to Chicago and saw this specialist, went to the Mayo Clinic and saw another specialist, and they all said the same thing. Yeah, we think he, this is a good time for him to have open heart surgery. And I was like, open heart surgery? I mean, I feel fine. You know what I mean? I was like, I feel good. Mm. And they was like, yeah, and that's the toughest part because you're going to feel good right now. You know, and you're going to feel like nothing is wrong. But we're looking at your numbers and everything like that, and that is just not worth the risk. And I was like, ah, you got to be killing me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right now? So right now. That's, uh, I had to stop and, you know, have open heart surgery. Did, did you think it was all over? Or did they tell you you could play again, or what was it like? Yeah, they told me. No, no, they told me I would be fine. I think. I think the one thing is that the you know the media kind of wrote me off and said that it was going to be all over, and that's what really mm-hmm. gave me the push. You know, I remember I got into it with a, a reporter, Ivan Carter, who was at the Washington Post, and he wrote an article, and he he didn't represent or do the his homework as to what I actually had. So he linked all open heart surgeries together and they're not all the same. You know, I don't, I, you know, so it's, it's, you know, I would say lazy journalism. So, you know, what Lim Bias had is different than what, you know what I mean? You know, what, so everybody has something different and you can't just club everything as, as just like they're all the same. And so, you know, it, I started writing back, you know, I, you know, I'm sitting there, I can't do nothing anyway. So I just wrote back with the, with the Washington Post, wrote an article back to him and, you know, like open letter to him type thing, correcting all of his, his mistakes. And, you know, he didn't particularly take too kindly to that because, you know, most media people don't like if a player actually corrects them, you know, on their own right. platform. But the, the fact that a lot of media, you know, people kind of wrote me off, like say, okay, he's finished. That really gave me the drive and the push to really start, you know, coming back. Because I was, you know, NBA contracts are different. It's not like I was, if I was in the NFL, you know, I would have been cut that right after that, probably. Most likely. You know, because you you have a, a non-guaranteed contracts. You yeah. know, the contract situation is different. So with the NBA contract, I still had two or three years left on my contract. So a lot of people, you know, in my family were kind of like, well, why don't you just chill? You know, just chill, let your your, your contract run out. And then i like, nah. Cause they don't think I could come back. You know what I mean? So that gave me like the push. So I pushed and went on ahead and came back. Yeah. That's what's up, man. And then you um, play, I think you play one more year and then you got mm-hmm. traded. Yep. OKC, okay, right? Right, 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 right. In 2010, 2009, mm-hmm. 2010, mm-hmm. that young team. Oh man. Was, was Russ, Russ was there then, right? Yeah. Russ, it's it's James Harden. Okay. They, yeah. Uh, it was James Harden was a rookie. Uh, Russell Westbrook, you had KD, you had Serge Ibaka, you had Jeff Green. They had a crew. And I was Could like, you you know, me, yeah, me and Kevin Ollie, we were like the vets of the team. We were looking, we was like, man, these young cats don't even know how good they are. Like, we don't, they don't even know how good they're about to be. 
Like Serge Ibaka had no idea. Like he was just there playing. Like this, you know what I mean? No idea whatsoever. And we was like, man, if they keep these cats together, they're gonna win some championships. Like some championships. And you know, they couldn't keep them together. And they should have. They should, they should have. have. Yeah, they should have. That was a big mistake. You at least win one championship before you start breaking people up. You pay them cats what they need to get paid and keep everybody there. And the funny thing is, that was, you just, it was almost in a sense before the era of having all these superstars. You, you had KG them, and then you had Miami, but it still wasn't as impactful all throughout the whole, you know, NBA. But as they broke up, now you see oh. superstars linking up together. Yeah, but, just see, to but this was different because they were young. Right. They, they were young were, and they, they came together, young. right. So they would they would have grown up to a, to a super right. team. You know what I mean? Right. So they would have been younger and then grown into a super team from being younger, not af- having to have nobody else come in. That would have been a Cause, special cause I, case. Because I wonder if, if they – I mean, I know they're slapping themselves in the face now, but I wonder if, let's say – if that has already started happening, but you had drafted them three, they still was on the same team, would they have kept them together? I think they would have. Wait, wait, say it again? You said if they would have drafted them all together? So they drafted them all together, but let's say if the super team, super team start happening while they were still in OKC, I don't think OKC would have, uh, I think they would have signed all three of them. I don't know, man. I think it was kind of like a salary cap type thing. And they wanted to get, you know, they didn't want to go that much far over the salary cap. And we're looking at for different reasons, for economic reasons. And that's, that's what's up. Mm-hmm. I don't think it had anything to do with it. Like, like, like we saw with the last dance with Kraus. Kraus, you know, wanted to go for economic reasons to get under the salary mm-hmm. cap and, you know, start all over and rebuild for the, which is ridiculous. Like, why would you want, you just won six championships. Why would you go for your seventh and eighth? You're supposed to keep going. If somebody does beat you, then they got to beat you again, and then you break it all up. But until that happens, you keep going. <laughs> Don't remind like me, man. All right, my bad, my bad. I didn't want to bring up all this stuff. But <laughs> I'm like, man. And then what's crazy is Reinsdorf was like trying to trying to skate all the blame in it. Like, oh, yeah, no, I didn't want Scottie Pippen to sign that contract. I told him not to sign it. Like, wait a minute. You're the CEO. You know what I mean? What you mean? You right. told him not to sign it. You, you know, don't, don't. I mean, I know Kraus was 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 who he was, but don't put all the blame on Kraus. You know what I'm saying? You, you had to okay everything. Right, right. You could change everything. <laughs> right, exactly. He did the same thing to the White Sox. I know you're not a baseball fan, but he did the same thing. Same to thing. the White Sox. In '94, they they had built something before they uh, went on strike. Mm-hmm. They were they were looking like, okay, this is something huge, and he yeah. tore them all up. So. Yeah, man. Yeah, he always had a habit of that. But um, yeah, that, that was unfortunate with uh OKC, and then, of course, all three win an MVP. So it's like crazy, it's crazy, man. Crazy. So I want to really get into the good stuff. Okay. So, um, man, first of all, let me ask you before we really get into that: what made you become an activist? Oh well, I mean, I, I was this the people that knew me growing up. And it's so funny when you, you know, talking to other people who like grew up with me, like in high school, they all say, yeah, you've been this way since then. You're just doing it on a different level. And like, we knew that you would be this person back mm-hmm. at, at Booker T. Washington High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, because I have, I have kind of been, you know, I was doing speech and debate when I was in high school. So I was, you know, I wanted to write, you know, speeches like Malcolm X, you know, first. That's what I wanted to do. I started learning about Malcolm when I was in middle school. So as I got to high school, I was like, oh, OK, yeah, I could write speeches like Malcolm X and perform different places and, you know, talk about different things and stuff like that. So I started doing that and I started debating different topics. And, you know, so I just started loving it. So we were Booker T, we was winning state championships in basketball and we was also winning state championships in speech and debate. So it was just like, that's what I always did. You know, I wasn't always just one thing. I always, I always did both. And I carried that on through Syracuse. I did the same thing in Syracuse and did it while I was in the pros. And then I, then I get, you know, I'm here in DC with the Wizards and DC is just a political, you know, just political energy all over the place. And then you had the, the war in Iraq happen. So I'm, spe- I'm doing, you know, spoken word and poetry and speaking at different places all across DC. And I'm talking about different things about the, 
you know, the system and about George Bush and about, so I just kind of kept, kept going, doing what I've always done, just using my position as a platform. And I grew up admiring athletes that did that. Like I grew up admiring people like Bill Russell and Muhammad Ali and Kareem. Those are the athletes that I grew up really wanting to emulate. Mm. So now you look at today, what we're dealing with, I mean, George Floyd, what mm-hmm. happened with him, his mm-hmm. killing, um, of course, by cops. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Ahmed Aubrey. With you having a platform that you have, even myself and all of us yeah. that do have the platforms, what what can we do? What is the best way to go about this? So I, I, so I, wrote, I wrote a book called We Matter, Athletes and Activism. And in my book, I interviewed a lot of different athletes, you know, from – from yesteryear and, and now. I interviewed Bill Russell and Kareem and John Carlos and Craig Hodges and Mahmoud Abdul-Aruf. And then from now, I interviewed like Eric Reed and, um, you know, Russell Westbrook and uh, Dwayne Wade and all, all those guys too. So, but I also interviewed family members of the victims of police brutality. So I interviewed like um, Eric Garner's daughter, Emerald, mm-hmm. and, and uh, Trayvon Martin's brother, Javaris. And Terrence Crutcher's uh, sister, uh, Tiffany Crutcher, and Valerie Valerie Castile, who's Philando Castile's mother, and I started doing work with them, in particular to tackle this issue of police brutality. You know, I did a lot of work with Sabrina Fulton and Trevor Martin's mom, and you know they're running for um, you know political positions in their respective cities, and you're seeing that a lot. But one of the things that really um, inspired me a lot was in particular Tiffany Crutcher who and so if you don't remember what happened her brother Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa Oklahoma um he was his car was pulled over to the side of the road and it was broken down it wasn't working and a policeman came up to him and he thought that the policeman was coming to help him you know because his car had been broken down he's like oh okay cool the police is here to help me but they were like you know get your hands up you know everything like that he was like, whoa, what, 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 what's going on? He, had, he wasn't the suspect in anything. He didn't do anything wrong. There was no guns. There was no weapon. There was no, that, that's the scenario. Helicopter came. Helicopter, they had him on, on, on you know, take kind of saying, he looks like a bad dude. Be careful. Proceed with caution type thing. And the, the police officer, Betty Shelby, ended up killing him, Right. So, so Tiffany Crutcher has had this passion to really change the way that, that the police operate. And so what she says, and this is, you know, something that I really, to answer, and this is a long way of answering your question. What she says right. from doing all of the work that we've been doing together, she says that you cannot change somebody's heart. You cannot. You cannot legislate their heart. You can give them sensitivity training, all that other stuff. You can't change their heart. What you have to do is change the laws so that even if their heart isn't right, they can't act on their bias or their racism or their anger or their hatred. So she has been pushing to make the laws different to where, like, say, for instance, a police officer has to show probable cause of rendering their firearm. You know what I mean? Like They can't just say I was in fear for my life and that be it, because that's what Betty Shelby did. Officer Betty Shelby, she was on the stand. Every time they said something, they were like, well, they, did, did he show a gun? Did he show this? She was like, well, I was in fear for my life. She just kept repeating the phrase. And right. so she's pushing to where a police officer has to actually show an actual immediate threat for that to justify them using their firearm. Now, that changes everything. You know what I mean? Right. Um, also, like Emerald Garner, the, the, the chokehold that the, the officer Daniel Pantaleo used to choke her father to death, she's pushing to have it outlawed all throughout the state of New York. So she's doing the same thing. So those those really, you know, we, we have to hold police accountable and we have to change mm-hmm. the laws. Those are the things. Like, and I, I have to agree with them. And doing all this work, and we've done all these all these different programs and everything like that, you can't change people's heart. You can't. Yeah. That's not yeah. going to work. You know what I mean? If they have that bias, if they look at you or me and they're afraid, you know, and, and, and that's just what happens. I mean, that you you can't how you, you can't change that. Yeah, it, it's it's sad, and that's I definitely wanted to ask you that because I was I just had a I'm not gonna say his name. I had a conversation um, with somebody, 
on Facebook and mm-hmm. <laughs> and we were talking about um Trayvon Martin's mother running. Mm-hmm. And and I, I posted the link up, right? And the guy came on, he's a white guy, and he he stated he was like, um, yeah, well, her son wasn't what what did he say? Something like her well, her so called son of an angel, you know, so called son that was an angel, um, is not gonna help her out. And of course, I'm just like, bro, what does that have to do with her running? What does that have to and do? what does that have to do with that killing? Anyway, you know, just and the thing but, about it is the thing that's so tough with this is that, you know, the that's always the immediate response is they start looking to demonize the person who was actually killed. Not demonizing the cop, not looking at right. the cop's past, not saying look at the past the cop's history or anything like that. They're looking at the history of the person who was killed. To justify and say, oh, well, you know, it's not that serious. He wasn't that good of a kid. He wasn't that good of a guy. And bringing up some stuff that has nothing to do with the person being killed. And it's amazing. Like, when you hear different justifications like that always happen. Like, it follows like a script. And mm-hmm. it, it's 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 just... And, and one of the things that, that I'm doing with my book is that... And it... And it I'm glad that it's successful in this way, but it's also frustrating that it's successful for this reason is because you have, you know, I'm, I've been speaking well before this pandemic, of course, but um, I was speaking at colleges all across the country, colleges and universities all across Ivy League, Harvard, Yale, you know, HBCUs, Morehouse, um, you know, Spelman, um, how all across the country. Right. And. From white people. They say that. Hearing Dwayne Wade say it or hearing Russell Westbrook say it makes them say, well, wait a minute now. This they ha- this might be something like, well, this isn't right if they're so upset. And I'm like, it's frustrating that it takes Dwayne Wade saying it for right. you to look at the Trayvon Martin case and saying something is wrong with that case. But that's the reality. Like I've gotten so, so much, so many, so much response I mean, I've gotten invited to different places just for them to talk about, ask me, you know, about a particular story that one particular athlete said that struck them. You know what I mean? And the story is talking about what he saw that happened to somebody else. Is that that's just it's it shouldn't be like that, but that's 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 what gets mainstream America. So so in saying that, you're right, it shouldn't be like that at all when it comes to these athletes and I I say that I always say, even with Jordan and the situation with the governor, which I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't think he's ever passed for that, but at right. the same time, right, I say right. that's not, I mean, we can't get, I, we can't get mad at an athlete if that's just not them. They don't do that. But at the same right. time, should, should athletes speak up more or, Cause it could, it, I mean, definitely it could be. Um, we see how it affected, you know, like you said, the, the white people that came up to you. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what it is there a way that they can, or is it something that it can do? We know Adam Silver is is more for the players in the NBA doing it. Of course, we know mm-hmm. the NFL; they don't want that right. situation. So, how do you feel about that? So everything like, I'm do- doing, everything I'm doing with my book is to encourage athletes to use their voices. Um, you know, I'm showing athletes that, listen, I'm, I've, I've interviewed Adam Silver. I've interviewed Mark Cuban. I've interviewed Ted Leonsis. They've been on record saying you're not going to get punished. This whole myth to try to destroy the myth that if you speak out, you're going to hurt your chances. They're going to, you know, people are not going to want to back off of you. You know, I try to destroy that. I try to show the athletes from the past, show the athletes in the present who are using their voices. I showed specifically from, so, so like, like Javaris, uh, Trevor Martin's brother, he told me a story. Mm-hmm. He said, he, during the interview, he said, if it weren't for athletes, he doesn't feel that anybody would know his brother's name. And I was like, wow, that's pretty strong. Why do you say that? He's like, because people, and this is him talking, he said, because people forget that when Trayvon Martin was first, first killed, the family, they were trying to get um, uh, some news, to co- the local news to cover it, and nobody wanted to cover it. He's like, they all told them, well, this is just another young black man that got killed. This is not really newsworthy. I was like, that's what they told you? He was like, that's what they told us for a long time. He's like, but then 
Trayvon. Uh, then then um, LeBron James started talking about it. And then D. Wade started talking about it. Then the whole team posed in the hoodies and said, we are Trayvon Martin. And then all the people who love LeBron James and love Dwayne Wade were like, well, what is this that has uh, LeBron James and D. Wade all riled up? And then they started paying attention. Then you had all the different media. And I was just like, wow. But again, that goes to the frustration because it shouldn't be like that. But that no, so, so so I tell young people, I show young people that 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 interview specifically from Javaris and him telling it to encourage them the power of their voice. Now, I won't say that it should be, I don't go as far as to say that it should be a requirement. Requirement is kind of a hard, a, you know, that's, yeah, that's harsh. Hard. Right. right. But I'll say that you have a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous platform. But a requirement is kind of tough because, and I'll say this honestly, some athletes, you don't want them saying nothing. No. That's not the truth. You're going to say the wrong thing, look all crazy, and then they, 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 they make you look like a buffoon, then that hurts all other athletes. You know what I mean? If you don't know what, you, if you don't know what you're talking about, don't say nothing. But, 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 I, but the athletes that have a passion, because when you, when you speak out about something, you have to almost go into like a speech and debate mode because you know that they're immediately going to try to attack you. First, mm-hmm. they're going to make it seem like you don't know what you're talking about. That's number one. And then what they're going to do is they're going to try to come at you with everything to try to negate what you said. And so you have to be able to come with a response. You have to become with the with 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 a, with a retort, you know, I mean, because you have to you have to be able to present your positions, um, you know, on on the topic in the different layers of it. And if you don't, then they cast you off. Ah, that's why you should stick to basketball. That's what people do. Yeah. And, and the interesting part is. That happens on the left and the right. That's not just the right that does that. If anybody mm-hmm. disagrees with you, they because the left will come at you just as strong as the right will if they if You're you speak lying. out on a topic that they disagree with. It, that You're that happens. <laughs> so it ain't, it ain't, it ain't <laughs> a one thing. You know what I mean? It's both sides that do that. Man, that's that's horrible. Before we let you go, um, I usually um, ask let one of the um, watchers, you know, uh, people who's watching and comment, they have sure. a question, I put it up. So I'm going to put up this question right here. Um, Vincent David Jackson asks, and what are your thoughts on MJ telling Thorne that he didn't want to Isaiah on the dream team? Okay, Vincent David Jackson. Um, so I I actually interviewed um, Isaiah Thomas uh, for, for a program that I'm doing called The Rematch. Um, I just came out with a few of the interviews. I interviewed Kareem. I interviewed Isaiah Thomas and I interviewed Craig Hodges. Wonderful interviews. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. later on, I'm going to come out with Adam Silver um, that I interviewed and, you know, some other interviews with Jamel Hill has some great interviews. Um, but Isaiah Thomas was interesting because I interviewed Isaiah Thomas for an hour and he didn't say one bad word about MJ. Not one bad mm-hmm. word. He, he, had a, he had a little bit to say about Pippen. You know what I mean? But he didn't say anything bad about MJ. And I think, you know, when people are saying from this, from the documentary, and they're saying, well, you know, it wasn't just MJ. Other people had issues with him. And this person had an issue. And this person had an Isaiah, Prince issue with Isaiah Thomas. I'm like, now y'all come on, be real. It, didn't nobody care what Karl Malone thought. Didn't nobody care what, you know, nobody else thought. It was about what MJ thought. <laughs> and even if there were other people who had issues, MJ was the one who said, if he play, I ain't playing. They don't matter. Did nobody else give that ultimatum? MJ, the old bit, like, like you hear other people saying, like I think David Robbins said, yeah, other people had a little issues with MJ, but then nobody else say nothing. It was MJ that said, you know, that if Isaiah Thomas don't play, then I'm not playing. And I was just like, that's one of, you know, I had a few criticisms of the documentary. I'm not going to say I love the documentary. I thought it was great, The Last Dance, but you know, I had a few criticism. That was one of them. I was like, okay, hold up now. Just just say you said it. Don't, <laughs> no, you know, because MJ was kind of dancing around it with it. He was like, well, it wasn't just me. You know, I didn't really say that to Rod Thorne in particular. I just asked who else was going to be on the team. I was like, come on now, MJ. Everybody know good and well that you said it. So now you, you saw the video of the tapes come out. You know what I mean? Even though I hate that TMZ is the one that brought him out because I don't, you know, yeah. I care about TMZ. But you could hear MJ saying it, which we all knew anyway. 
you know, right, but right. I thought that, and another thing, let me just say, you didn't ask this, but another thing I didn't like about the, the thing is that you had a whole section on the activism part and you didn't include Craig Hodges. Come on now, man. Come on so, now, man. Come on, come on man. <laughs> we, we, ta- we had him on, we had him on the show. So, okay. uh, you know, how he talked about, and of yeah. course, thank God, I, you know, Hey, we own our show. We, we come up with our stuff. So right. I, I was able to ask him, and he talked about that. He talk, yeah. We talked about him getting blackballed. We talked about Craig Hodge. Shout out to Craig. Mm-hmm. We yeah. talked about Thank him um, when, in 91. He was, mm-hmm. he planned to, um, to boycott game one. He went to yep. Magic and Mike. Yep. He talked about that. How they yep. were like, nah. I'm they were like, nah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. I asked him the same thing, so I interviewed him as well. And I asked him, I was like, how is your relationship with, with MJ? He was like, I'm good. He's like, it wasn't no like personal. I, he's like, I, mean, I had no personal beef with him. It was just the things that he stood for were diametrically opposing to what Greg Hodges stood for. He's like, it wasn't personal. He's like, he wanted MJ to use his voice. You had all these kids killing themselves over your shoes. And I'm coming every day looking at you and you ain't saying nothing about it. He's like, I got a problem with that. <laughs> You know what I mean? He was like, then, you know, he, he was like, MJ had the power. It wasn't, he said some of the things, it wasn't even about money. Like his power and his voice was more powerful than his money. Like he, right. he could have said, peace be still. And everybody would have been still. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like that type of power. And he was like, when you have that kind of power, like, I don't see how you can't use it. Like he was just, you know, he wanted things to be different. And he's from Chicago. So he's like, we had a lot of stuff going on in Chicago. How could you not speak about it? So it wasn't personal, you know what I mean? So I, it was, I had a lot of respect for Craig Hodge. But yeah, in the documentary, they even showed a little bit of the White House visit, and they showed B.J. Yeah. Armstrong shooting threes. I'm like, B.J. Armstrong, man, where's Craig Hodges? Is right there. <laughs> it's like right, they was right. almost. It's like it was almost intentional. Like you, they, like the camera would be panning. And it would be close to Craig Hodges, and they'd be like, rup, rup, and they go and they keep going. I'd be like, y'all really trying hard not to show Craig Hodges. So that part, uh, that part, I didn't like. <laughs> well, well, Craig, you know, uh, Craig said he said uh, he told us he was like um, he before it came out. Well, I didn't know, but he was saying that how Jordan controlled everything. He was like, yeah, yeah man, it's a lot of stuff that they kept out. Jordan made yeah. sure that it was certain stuff that came out. They didn't. Yeah want to ruffle no feathers or whatever, but right. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, you, LeBron, he, he has, mm-hmm. LeBron has that, has that, um, I guess platform to where if he say peace be still, you know, is getting, mm-hmm. especially in the NBA mm-hmm. and he's used that. What mm-hmm. your thoughts on him being able to use his platform to, um, help out communities and make certain statements that, you know, is good for us. Oh, I think it's been fantastic. I mean, I'll tell you, like I I, I asked Kareem Abdul-Jabbar that question, you know, as far as, you know, asking him about the GOAT and the GOAT conversation and stuff like that. And he said, you know, people are, you know, worried about the wrong thing. Like, don't nobody care about that. Like, that don't even matter. He's like, what, what LeBron is doing right now is way more important than everything that he's doing on the court. Like, he, what he's doing and using his voice and using his platform and, the, the power of it. And he's like, he's standing on the shoulders of the people that came before him. And, he, you know, he talked about Jackie Robinson. He talked about Muhammad Ali. He's standing on their shoulders and what he's doing and, you know, how he's setting the, the, the bar for athletes after him. And he said, and the athletes after him are going to follow. He's like the next superstar like Zion. He's going to be influenced by what LeBron is doing. This is all what Kareem is saying. So mm-hmm. that, that just tells you the level of, you know, what the significance of what LeBron is is doing. You know, he's the top player at his craft right now and he has a social conscious. That's a yeah. That's 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 a that's a great combination. <laughs> you know that's what I mean? Right man, <laughs> man, man, man. So much respect to him. Much respect. All right, E time, we gotta let you go, man. All right, cool. Um, been there for a while, man, but all good. Man, loved it. This this was great. We gotta have you back. That's um great. Let me know. Yeah, we, we gotta do that. Yes, yes sir. sir. Keep yes, doing, sir. keep doing your thing. Keep spitting out these good interviews, man. So we we need like yeah. we need good. You know, it, it, it's different because the, the 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 black media is so important right now. 
And you even saw it, and, and you saw it in the last dance where MJ was like, you know, I ain't talking to none of y'all, but I'll talk to Ahmad Rashad. You know what I mean? Because there's a right, certain right. different way that he related to him. We need uh, people in the media like you. So keep doing your thing, uh, for real. But stay encouraged and keep doing what you're doing. Appreciate that, man. Definitely, man. So once again, it's Raphael Haynes, a.k.a. Mr. Controversy, and I got my man Eton Thomas. Um, if y'all looking at the, twi- uh, the ticker, go ahead and uh, make sure y'all follow him at Eton Thomas 36 and check out the website, EtonThomas.com. Also, make sure you follow the Three Point Conversion at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. All right, until then, will you miss me? I'll holler at y'all. Peace.